Um, welcome everybody to the police and fire retirement um, plan and healthcare trust meeting for August 6, 2020. Um, it's about 8.33 right now. Uh, quick roll call, myself, Andrew Gardner is present. Um, Trustee Drew Lonza. I'm here, Andrew. Uh, we've got to welcome the, uh, the newest trustee, um, Sunita Ganapati, you present? So I, I see you, but we can't hear you. Yeah, we still can't hear you. I see if I, I see you. a thumbs up. I know you're working on it. So yeah. we're gonna go to the next person. We'll come back to you, Sunita. Okay. Uh, Trustee Howard Lee. Here. Uh, Good morning, here. Howard. Uh, Trustee uh, um, Ezra Menon. Present. Uh, Trustee Nick Muyo. Here. Uh, Trustee Dick Santos. Here. Trustee Vincent Zeri. Present. Uh, Trustee <clears throat> Franco Votto. Here. All right. I've uh, got all the trustees here. Uh, we got uh, our. Uh, Council of um, Pam Foley. I don't know. I don't believe she's on yet, but she normally comes in right afterwards. Uh, we got our um, Harvey Lederman, our General Fiduciary Council, is present. We also have Roberto Pena, our CEO. Um, Prabhu Palani, our CIO, is present. Um, I also believe I've seen um, Barbara Heyman um, on the line also, and all the supporting staff and investment investment or investment um, members are joining this call to sort of support and to participate. So thank you for everybody being here. Um, I do, before we jump into closed session, um, I do want to um, welcome Sunita Ganapati. She's our newest uh, trustee. Um, this is her first meeting. Um, I do want to welcome her um, and give the opportunity to um, her to say anything if she would like. Sunita, Sunita do you, is your volume working yet? I'm able to hear you. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, welcome. wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for the welcome, uh, Andrew. And uh, I'm excited to be serving on this board. I think it's re it's not often that you get the opportunity to be able to volunteer with something where you know your background fits uh, really well. So I, I just by way of introduction, I come with uh, about 25 years of experience across investment research, investment management, um, and risk management in banking. Uh, my career spanned three large institutions, Wells Fargo most recently and Lehman Brothers before that. And yes, I wasn't there for the uh, collapse. I left before that and uh, uh, way back early in my career at Bank of America. So I've been really in the banking industry, but my experience is certainly much more on the investment side. I look forward to getting to know all of you uh, at some point, somewhere in the future in person. And in the meanwhile, uh, this is you know, an honor to be here. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate it. We're all excited to have you here and we look forward to getting, getting to know you um, as, as the time goes by and hopefully we get to get back to our meetings in person and, and get to know you a little better in person. Um, I know uh, Eswar wanted to make a few comments. Um, Eswar? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And Sunita, welcome. Uh, I've known Sunita for about 20 years. Uh, I think she's talented, experienced, has great knowledge of the investment world. So I think She's a great addition. I think she brings an element of diversity to this board too. Um, and I think the most important thing with Sunita is we have to keep her on board because you know what happened when she left Lee? You know what's happened to Wells Fargo when she left Wells Fargo, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ishwar. Sure, uh, I'm sure I'll keep this going. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, my, the one uh, piece of diversity besides, you know, the obvious features is I might mention that my background is almost entirely in fixed income, which I think a lot of, Board members are mostly on the equity side. That's my impression, but uh, correct me. All right, great. Thank you very much. We're, you're you're welcome. Um, welcome here, and uh, we're excited to have you. So at this moment, let's go ahead and uh, jump or jump to closed session. Um, I believe Linda, there will be something popping up on our screen for that. Yeah, Linda, can you yes. stay with us as we transition? Because I'm I volunteered to be scribe for this session, so stay with us, Linda, until I can confirm I can share my screen. Okay, and then you can, you can drop off. So, can you do that for us? So Drew, we're gonna make a, yeah. a, a slight adjustment real quick in closed session. 
so we are going to hear yeah. um we're going to go ahead and hear the uh, investment um discussion yeah. first um yeah. and then we're going to yeah. jump into because that'll be a shorter discussion and then we'll jump into yeah. the other ones great thanks andrew
This meeting is being recorded. So we're just going to wait a few minutes, make sure that everybody joins back over from our closed session um, before we get started here. So just bear us bear a few minutes with us. Good morning, Dr. Chairman. <laughs> hey, Doc. Let's go ahead and get uh, go and get started. Um, welcome back to open session. Um, uh, just before we jump into the first item, I uh, just want to go over uh, the um, uh, orders of the day, uh, which we do not have any, or we don't have any sunshines to wave. About orders of the day is um, just remember we're in a Zoom meeting. Um, let's be respectful. Uh, on all votes, we will do a roll call vote. I'll go down the list. Um, if you're not speaking, please um, uh, please have your um, your computer or your phone on mute to um, break the background noise down. Um, and yeah, and so that's it for um, orders of the day. We're gonna wave sunshine. And so we're gonna go into the first item. Uh, reevaluation of service connected disability. This is going to be 1A, uh, uh, King Hassan, police officer, police department, reevaluation of service connected disability effective June 4th, 2015, with 7.45 years of disability. Oh, sorry, uh, four, sorry, um, four point years of service. I'm sorry about that. So I see we have, um, before we get started, I think I see, I see Mr. Hassan's on the line. Um, I did believe I see, did Mr. Uh, Mr. Boyle on the line? Yes, I am. All right, perfect. Um, and then what about, I'm trying to look through the list here. Dr. Tierman, I believe I saw her. And is Russ on the line? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, so uh, let's let's go ahead and um, get started. Um, this is a re uh, review of service connected disability retirement status for um, King Hassan, police officer, police department, service connected disability, effective June 4th, 2015, with 7.45 7 7 years of service. Uh, Mr. Hassan is presented by attorney um, Tom Boyle. Um, will uh, Attorney Tom Boyle and Mr. Hassan please unmute your mic microphone. Will you be presenting any witness other than yourself today? No, I, I'm going to do a, a, a presentation, a brief presentation, and I'm not sure, I don't think I'm going to call Mr. Hassan, Officer Hassan. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Stacy Fisher, uh, who will present the summary of the applic uh, application and Dr. Tierman, who will present the results of her review of the medical records and medical examination of the applicant. This is Stacy. This is a review of service-connected disability retirement status for King Ottawamni Hazan, police officer, police department, service-connected disability retirement effective June 4th, 2015. He has 7.45 years of service. Mr. Hassan is represented by attorney Tom Boyle.
Dr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Um, Mr. Hassan was brought before us because uh, some people found some tapes and he was on a TV show where he was seen doing activities that was felt that he would be able to go back to work as the police department. We reviewed the tapes and sent him out to a uh, functional capacity in Los Angeles where he is living now. The doctor of uh, physical therapy who did it gave a very excellent functional capacity test. He noted that um, Mr. Hassan had problems with uh, sitting for long periods of time. He favored his left knee and recommended, felt that he would be unable to do sustained squatting, crouching, or lifting above waist level. <laughs> and these were all validated by the functional capacity. We did have it reviewed by an outside retirement uh, person who felt that he could go back as a police officer. I did re-review everything and I felt looking at the fact that Mr. Hassan is, would be a police officer, he would not be able to do sustained running, apprehending <clears throat> of subjects, um, suspects, not subjects, um, safely if he needed to run or how to use repeated squatting or crouching, or how to go from a sitting position to start in action. <clears throat> Therefore, we felt after reviewing the situation, I recommended that the uh, service retirement uh, continue. Right, thank you, uh, Dr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Boyle and Mr. Hassan, will you please confirm that you received the staff letter dated July 28th? 2020 notifying you of this meeting yes i did receive it this is tom boyle speaking yes i also received it this is king hassan speaking all right thank you both uh will you stipulate to the relevance of the report to review of the disability re um, disability retirement the relevance of the reports yes okay and do you wish to introduce additional medical records or other document um, documents, evidence to the board for consideration? No, not at this time. Okay. Um, and you still at this point, there's going to be no other um, witnesses. It's just going to be a presentation by yourself, um, but you do have the option to um, ask uh, Mr. Hassan. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I would like to, at this time, introduce uh, Russ Riqueda, Disability Council, to summarize the committee's position, basis for the position, and evidence and record supporting the position. His memo is included in the attachment provided for the, for this, for the item. Hi. Uh, I'd like to begin by correcting an error that's in the memo uh, that's before you. Um, um, it should be clarified that the Disability Committee did not make a recommendation. So the memo is incorrect when it states that. Instead, it would be better to uh, state, and the memo should have stated, that although the committee saw no reason to Mr. Hussan's disability status, uh, Russ, can I stop you real quick? Given the you in recent history that a reevaluation. Russ, 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 can yes? I stop you for a second? I'm stopped. I, I apologize. Uh, there was a really bad connection, and there's probably about five seconds we lost of your conversation. So, <laughs> can you back up maybe 20 seconds from, and start over if you don't mind? Oh, no problem. Um, uh, uh, to repeat the most important thing, the memo in your materials is incorrect in one important aspect. <clears throat> it's incorrect in that it states the committee came to a recommendation. That is not correct. The disability committee did not come to a recommendation. Instead, what the memo should have stated is that although the committee saw no reason to modify Mr. Hussan's disability status, but given the novelty of this reevaluation issue, the committee 
thought it best for the full board to consider this matter without a recommendation from the committee coming before the, the board itself. In other words, that the board should consider all of the evidence that's available and that has been provided to it and come to its own decision on this novel uh, issue. Now, uh, so that's the ultimate conclusion uh, uh, of the committee. Um, Dr. Tierman has summarized, I think, the relevant information in that, uh, but just ampl amplify very briefly, hopefully to assist the board. Uh, in May 2010, Mr. Hussan suffered injuries to his knees on the job by jumping off a fence in pursuit of a suspect. That was in May 2010. Uh, in March 2015, the board's then medical director, uh, Dr. Raj Das, concluded that an appropriate work restriction for Mr. Hussan was no sustained running, jumping, or squatting. And on the basis of that, the board in June 2015 granted Mr. Hassan a service-connected disability retirement. Then we moved to July 2018, where the videos indicate that Mr. Hussan, or at least on the videos, are indications that Mr. Hussan is running and performing other activities. Um, in light of those videos, the board referred this matter back to the Disability Committee, which then uh, uh, authorized uh, a functional capacity evaluation for Mr. Hassan, which occurred in November 2019, last November, uh, with, with the work restriction recommendations that Dr. Tierman has just summarized. And then in January of this year, Dr. Tierman issued her supplemental report uh, with the work restriction of no continuous running and jumping. And both the, the functional capacity evaluator and also Dr. Tierman reviewed the videos and took what they saw on the videos into account <clears throat> and in coming to the recommendations they did. And then in January of this year, the department indicated that it could not <clears throat> accommodate the work restrictions that Dr. Tierman had included in her January report. So that's where we're left. And uh, that's, I think, a fair summary of the evidence uh, or the most persuasive evidence before the committee. But again, the I'm sorry, before the board. But the Disability Committee did not come forth with a recommendation to the board and instead wanted the board to consider this sort of fresh. Uh, and th th those are my only remarks. All right, uh, th uh, thank you Russ for that. Dr. Tierman, do you have anything um, to add to your written report uh, for the board's consideration? Um, not at this time. If anyone has any questions about it, I would be happy to amplify. All right, thank you. Is there a representative from the police department who wishes to add anything to the department memo dated January 17th, 2020 on accommodations of work restrictions or wish to present any other testimony relevant to the issue to be determined in this hearing? This is Gina Tabaldi and no, I have nothing to add. All right, thank you, Gina. All right, Mr. Boyle and Mr. Hassan, uh, please present your testimony in support of your case. Okay, uh, this is Tom Boyle, Attorney Boyle speaking. Uh, I won't give all of my presentation because uh, Dr. Tierman and uh, Attorney Riqueda have already done most of that, but uh, just to emphasize that the functional capacity evaluation test uh, measured his residual capacity for activity and Dr. Los Reyes, who performed the functional capacity evaluation, <laughs> determined that Officer Hossein would be unable to return to full duty without restrictions. 
and the retirement board medical doctors, Dr. Susan Chairman determined that due to his injuries, he is still with work restrictions, which include no continuous running, no jumping, squatting, or heavy lifting objects below the waist level. Dr. Timmerman concluded that Officer Hassan still has work restrictions and meets the definition of disability according to the San Jose Municipal Code. Officer Hassan and I as counsel urge the retirement board not to modify Officer Hassan's disability retirement status. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Uh, Mr. Boyle and Mr. Hassan, would you like to question any other witness you have uh, that has testified? This is Attorney Boyle. I do not have any questions for any of the witnesses. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tierman, do you or uh, other witnesses uh, who have testified, have you, do you have any rebuttal to the testimony provided by the applicant? No, I do not. All right. So if, there's, if there is no other um, rebuttals that uh, either uh, Dr. Tierman or Mr. Boyle have, um, we will, what I would like to do at this point is um, turn the floor over to the two members that sit on the um, Disability Committee, um, Trustee Santos and Trustee Lanza. And if you could uh, give us a walkthrough um, of your guys' conversation at the committee level and your guys' thinking and how you evaluate um, ca uh, disability cases. Mr. Santos? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, none of this stuff is always easy, but uh, first of all, I wanna thank the, the persons who brought it to the board's attention. It was then we had a meeting and the board allowed the disability committee to do the investigation. Mr. Raketa did an excellent job in his memo. And uh, we have a great uh, group of folks with uh, Drew uh, on the, as, a board, as a committee member, Catherine, Stacy, and of course, Russ, and Roberto, and of course, Dr. Chairman. Uh, we, re we had the investigation. Uh, the memo speaks for itself. Uh, we um, <clears throat> always follow the law and follow the medical evidence. And uh, like Russ said, uh, this was an issue for the whole board to take, take a look at and make a decision. And uh, uh, what I've read from Dr. Chairman and Russ's memo, nothing has changed. So I thank everybody. There's, I make things short because they are short. If there was something else to say, I would, but there's nothing else to say. The evidence speaks for itself. This is not a popularity contest. We, again, we listen to our doctor who we respect highly and we look at the law, what Russ provides and we go from there. Thank you, Dick. Uh, Drew. Thanks, <clears throat> Dick. I, I echo what Dick's saying. So you guys know me, I'm, I'm not the short speaker. I'm sort of the space and time guy. So this may, the whole thing may seem a bit odd to you because we're doing something that I've been here, Dick, now 10 years and been to you too. We've never done this before. So bear with us. We're, we're, we're hearing a disability case where as all the witnesses have said, we had reason to think that something material might have changed since we granted disability five years ago. So we're being very formal because we've never done this before. And, and I just want to interject. So I reached out um, to counsel for what the guardrails are. It's a new process. We haven't done this before being formal. So first, let me just uh, talk briefly about the initial grant of the disability, right? So we have this checklist thing that, that Dick and I have put together. And when we applied that checklist five years ago, it's pretty straightforward. Was the applicant injured while on the job? Yes and yes. Uh, was there a modified duty available? Department could not accommodate work restrictions. Yes and yes and yes, okay. Five out of six of those boxes are checked. The sixth box is often where our committee, Dick and I really struggled with, with Russ and staff and uh, uh, Dr. Chairman. It's that maximally medically improved box. I mean, we really took in the crystal ball and say, is this person ever going to, to get better? Can this person in, in two or three or four years return to, to work? So that's the question in front of the board. Five to six boxes, I don't think are in, in debate. The question is, were we wrong when we said five years ago, we don't believe this person um, will get better? 
and you've heard from Dr. Chairman um, on that. Now, just for the record, and this is kind of the point of my speaking out, when Dick and I hear a case, when, when Russ and Dr. Chairman's staff hear a case, we, we have to use more than just the medical evidence. We have to synthesize all this stuff. There, a lot of these cases are in the gray zone. Will he ever get better? I mean, come on, that's, that's crystal ball kind of stuff, um, right? Now, Harvey says the guardrails here for what we're doing today um, and perhaps terminating uh, Mr. Hassan's disability status are pretty straightforward under the city code and slightly different than what we did five years ago. And that's why I just real quick want to address this. So Harvey first confirms we absolutely have a right in the city code to call before us any member like Mr. Hassan where we wonder if something material has changed from when we first granted the disability. But Harvey also points out that on this second bite of the apple, the rules are very clear. Um, and I'm gonna read a quote now. Harvey says, we must limit ourselves to consider only the medical facts as evaluated by the doctor. We can't enter the gray zone this time. We did five years ago. We're not allowed to do that this time. That's how the rules are slightly changed. I want to I want to th thank you, Russ, um, for that a slight change. I thought your memo was excellent, Russ. Um, and when we reread the memo, we we at least I sort of realized. So you may ask yourself if Dr. Chairman says the disability should be there, and Dick and I are saying we see no reason um, to not to, to undo the disability. Why this is in front of the board? Well, two reasons. First, it's the first time we've ever done this. And so, therefore, I think the committee feels comfortable, uh, would feel more comfortable asking the board to see it. And there is an issue here. We have seen things on a videotape. Uh, but remember, we can't use our intuition on this. We have to rely on the medical record. But as Dr. Chairman said, um, there is evidence from two different doctors that conflict. Um, so, Andrew, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, board, uh, for helping the committee in hearing this. Um, well, I'm not quite sure what to do next, Andrew. Your chairman, you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do next is uh, we're going to uh, have the trustees an opportunity to ask any questions to um, Dr. Tierman, to, uh, to Russ, to Harvey, um, and, and, and we'll just, we'll just have uh, some dialogue. Um, questions can also be um, asked uh, to the attorney, uh, Mr. Boyle. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and just go down the roster. Um, but before we get started and, and we do that, um, this question is going to be uh, from me to either Dr. Tierman or um, Russ or Harvey. When we're taking this into consideration, and I think I've heard um, in the presentation already the, the answer, but just want you to reiterate it. We're looking at the, the evidence that has come forth from, you know, from the different evaluations that are in the medical packet. Um, Dr. Chairman's uh, interpretation and her recommendations, um, also from um, uh, Russ's um, comment. But do we take in consideration the outside, uh, the, the stuff outside of the medical packet regarding to the evaluation? Is that part of our process that we should be looking at, or are we looking strictly at the medical evidence um, and the restrictions um, that's in the file. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Dr. Chairman. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, I can answer it from my perspective. One, I think that the videos are extremely important. And we have to look at it and take it in context because when you first look at them, they can be very damning. But when you look at the whole thing, you have to determine how long was Mr. Hassan on this sort of jumpy thing? How was he afterwards? Did he have knee pain? Was he able to continue? Some of the other things that we saw were um, Facebook clips or uh, YouTube clips of him carrying a woman. Again, this, these are movies. We don't know if he carried the woman up the hill. We just know that the woman he was holding was on top of a hill. And we have to take all of those things into consideration because as you know, superficial things can damn you. And that's why the functional capacity becomes very important to take it into perspective. 
also what we saw and what we also saw in the functional capacity. Because it's not only in the moment, it's also endurance. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, Dr. shall I comment on that as well? Yes, go ahead, Harvey. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, I just want the board to understand that on this reevaluation, the, the city's law really uh, is very narrow. Um, we don't, after a, a service connected disability has been granted, we don't have the authority, even if something comes to light later, uh, to reconsider all of the reasons why it was granted um, at, at the time or whether the conditions are still there, except for a re-examination based on medical evidence. And that's the, only, that's the only basis that we're given under the city's municipal code to reevaluate someone. And that is to call them back for a medical evaluation. And solely on the basis of that medical evaluation to determine whether they are still incapacitated or not incapacitated for the performance of duty. And so the way the city has crafted this law uh, could have done any number of things and other jurisdictions are different, but here we are limited solely to calling the member back for a medical examination. And then on the basis of that me medical examination alone to again, determine whether that person is still incapacitated. So what that means is, as Dr. Tierman says, there were, as, as I understand it, we had a, a functional, someone who did a functional capacity test. And then we had another doctor do an evaluation. And Dr. Tierman evaluates all of that. As part of that record, those people will, in fact, look at the, these tapes, the other evidence that was gathered to see how they inform that medical determination that they've made. And then that rolls up to Dr. Tierman who looks at on behalf of the board, all of the material and says, based on that, I'm giving you a medical evaluation. And in this case, the doctor says, I believe that he is still incapacitated for the performance of duty, still has work restrictions that cannot be accommodated. That is the sum and substance of what the board is allowed to consider on this reevaluation because it's only related to the medical condition and permanent incapacity. We don't get to look at service connected or non-service connected or anything else. We only get to look at the, this medical evaluation. So it is a different, as Drew Lanza points out, it is different than the initial review that the disability committee goes through and the board goes through in approving a service-connected disability. It's now cabined by the city's law that says we can only look at medical reevaluation to make this determination. I hope that's helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Harvey, um, uh, Russ here, may I follow up with one question? Of course. Um, sure. If you notice in the, or as, as you saw in the functional capacity evaluation and as uh, mentioned in Dr. Tierman's January 2020 report, there's a new condition uh, that was not the basis for the board's decision back in 2015. That new decision, I'm sorry, that new condition they mentioned was lumbar degenerative disc disease and that there was a discussion in the functional capacity evaluation in Dr. Tierman's report about work restrictions that derive from that condition. So, so the, the, the question uh, I was uh, wondering about was whether in terms of the current medical evaluation um, that's being conducted, is it appropriate for um, conditions that exist now to be considered 
in deciding whether or not there should be any change in, in Mr. Hassan's disability status. Uh, Mr. Chairman um, and Mr. Rakeda, uh, if I, um, I, I believe that is appropriate uh, because the question is the, the, the text of the law is, is to the board shall determine whether the recipient is still incapacitated for the performance of duty, not whether the member is still incapacitated for the same reasons that the original grant was made. So if it turns out uh, in an extreme case, for example, that somebody went out uh, with knee injuries and five years later, they come back and they're a paraplegic, um, I don't think the board ignores that new basis on which uh, incapacity would be based. That person is still incapacitated for the performance of duty, perhaps for new reasons as well. Is that your understanding as well, Mr. Rakeda? Uh, yes, it is. But I deferred it to your interpretation, Harvey, and on this matter. Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Thank you both for, the, for those comments. Actually, all three of you, Dr. Chairman uh, spoke first. Um, and, so. and, and, Andrew, can I ask a question uh, for Harvey? Uh, so, um, so uh, Eswar? Um, yeah. We're going to go through the uh, the list right now. Okay. And and at that point, you could ask any questions you have for Harvey, yeah. for Dr. Chairman, for Russ, or Mr. Boyle. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and start with um, uh, Trustee Lee. Do you have any comments? Um, questions? No, I I don't have any comment. Only uh, one question: Is there a, is there a timeline to is today the, the day to make a decision or evaluation? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the plan is um, once we, everybody gets an opportunity to speak and we deliberate, the, the expectation is to make a decision today. Okay, thank you. I, I, have, I have no comment or question right now. All right, thank you. Um, Eswar. Yeah, so Javi, uh, I, so you say that this is a narrow decision uh, based on the medical facts. Uh, and, I, I, and I guess Dr. Tiernman is uh, uh, the main evaluator. How, I know, I, but I see in the memo that there's a differentiated opinion from the gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Dr. Uh, Wachowski. How, how are we supposed to incorporate that into, you know, thinking, I guess? Well, that you can evaluate as well, but uh, you, you essentially have engaged Dr. Tierman to, um, as your advisor to roll up all the um, subordinate, shall we say, medical review and to, and to present it to you with her advice. But uh, so I would pose any questions relating to the basis on which Dr. Tierman came to her conclusion to Dr. Tierman. So if I may ask Dr. Tim, thank you, Harvey. Uh, you know, how, you know, how, what do you think is the basis for your opinion being different from the evaluation done uh, by Dr. Wojcicki? Well, what's very interesting about Dr. Wojcicki is his conclusions. He felt that the functional capacity evaluation was valid, that the findings were real, and he had no quarrel with it. I think the problem that he had is he didn't quite understand what are the requirements of a police officer for the city of San Jose. And one of those requirements is that he needs to have prolonged running. So I think there was a disconnect by Dr. Wachowski exactly what he was supposed to say and what he actually saw. Okay. He might have meant, I didn't go back to him, I have to admit, and say, do you mean just modify duties or something else? Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, thank you, Andrew. Yep, no problem. Uh, Trustee Muglio. No question. All right. Trustee Santos, do you have any, I know you spoke earlier, do you have any um, follow-up? Yes, let me just give you some information 
just from myself from when I was active on the retirement board years ago. There was a different process going on and the person was brought back. Uh, a person came back and had the same restrictions and got hurt again in a short number of time. And so I question today, again, it's not a popularity contest. I totally agree with Drew. That's a great area. That's why we're brought up to the board. But what do we achieve when our doctor says, no, the restrictions and capacitation is still there. Someone comes back, gets hurt. It causes the system more money. And what about our liability? Those are issues that are always in my head. So I always look at the medical evidence. I look at the law and also the gray area and do the best we can. When we came to a, a like Drew said, it was new for everybody here. So we brought it to the board. I just use those caution flags as one to think about. Thank you, Trustee Santos. Uh, Trustee Ganapati, do you have any uh, comments or questions for anybody? I had a clarifying question on the lines of what Mr. Trustee Menon was saying. Uh, was the doctor in Wisconsin uh, hired by the board to evaluate the functional evaluation or was it some other party? Um, it was by retirement services. We had very a lot of difficulty even finding a doctor in Los Angeles who would actually physically see him. And we were able to get a functional capacity. And this doctor in Wisconsin was someone who has worked with workers' compensation in several different states. And that's how we eventually got him. But it took several months to even find a doctor who would even agree to review. I want to follow up on that. So is it part of the policy or procedure to have a a third party doctor evaluated rather than yourself, Dr. Lieberman? Yes, in general, what we do is if someone has an orthopedic injury, we try to get an orthopedist, neurolo neurologic industry, injury, et cetera. Then I coalesce all of the reports and also all the workers' compensation reports and come up with a conclusion and also do independent research in the medical literature to get an opinion. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sunita, you have any other questions? Oh, no, nothing else. Back to you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Trustee Sanzari. My system's frozen, Andrew. Okay. We, we can hear you. Andrew, I don't know if you can hear me. My system was frozen. Okay. We can do okay, we can now, hear you. All right. Now I'm back on. Thank you. Um, comment and a question. Comment. Um, I just want to state that I applaud the board for taking it serious. The um, fact that this was brought to our attention and for us revisiting it. I think it shows um, tremendous due diligence on our part and that we take it very serious when we do grant a disability. Um, so that's one comment I wanted to make. The question I have for Dr. Tierman is related to the advances in medical technology that's happened um, since the original disability was granted. Is there a non-surgical um, procedure or a methodology that could be used to help heal this injury and if so, then it would turn to the um, legal advisors to say, is that something that we could require? Dr. Chairman, I, we can't hear you. I'm sorry again. Um, Mr. Hassan went under many, many different uh, physical therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens in degenerative cases that there is very little surgically that can be done except only temporarily. And there's only so much that the tendon can heal after a period of time because there's so much scar tissue and other factors that wear out in the cartilage that unfortunately, even though we've made a lot of technological advantages, 
we can't remake cartilage once it's destroyed. We cannot cure a lot of degenerative changes because it's an ongoing inflammatory process, not just a mechanical process. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Vince. Uh, Trustee Votto. No, I have nothing. All right. Um, Trustee Lanza, I know you um, spoke at the very beginning um, just on the behalf of the disability um, committee along with Dick. Um, just wanted to circle back to you. Did you have any further comments on that since I skipped you? No, I think my take on this exactly matches Dick's. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, I appreciate all the comments, um, the questions that the trustees had. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Tierman, um, Russ Harvey for um, the explanation and also providing some type of guardrail for us to figure out how to evaluate this and make a decision. Um, as it's been mentioned many times in this meeting already, um, at least in the five years I've been on this board, it's the first time you know we've had one come up to the full board um, for consideration. Um, and, you know, so it's, everything's been handled you know, at the, or the committee level. Um, so this is a new experience um, for all of us in trying to figure out what those guardrails are. I think you guys have um, painted a good picture. Um, is there any, before we uh, make a motion, is there any further discussion any of the trustees want to um, have uh, in, in deliberation? Um, if so, go ahead and speak up. Well, I think the point, uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, Vince made, and we all feel the same way, and everybody takes this very seriously, is not to send a message out, we always have. And, and disabilities is a, is a, tough situation when it comes to sometimes when officers are young and something happens to them early as opposed to sometimes when you have someone older and they've had all these years and injuries and so on. But again, we're not doctors. We sit there, we work with Dr. Chairman and wait for the reports. And again, I, one more time, I think Russ's memo speaks for itself and I appreciate all our staff work and I appreciate this board and the seriousness they took to make sure the disability committee had all the resources we need to conduct a good evaluation and investigation. And thank you all. Thank you, Dick. Any other comments? All right, so if there's no other comments from the trustees um, or uh, from anybody else that's been participating uh, in, this, in this conversation, um, I would go ahead and um, entertain a motion. What does the motion look like, uh, Harvey? If we, if, if should we, did, should the board decide not to change anything? What does the motion look like? Well, if the board, uh, I think at this stage, uh, the only motion that would need to be made would be is if someone wants to make a motion uh, to find that the member is no longer incapacitated for the performance of duty. And if we believe the member is still incapacitated, as Dr. Chairman would recommend, is there a motion to sort of reaffirm that or anything? No, I don't think you'd need to do, uh, have a motion to maintain the status quo. We okay, so there's probably- Just consider the matter closed. Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm assuming no motion from Dick or me because I think we believe he's still incapacitated. All right, so, so we'll, we'll open up the, the floor to the trustees. Um, does anybody want to make a motion um, which would reverse uh, his disability um, based on the findings of in the file and discussion today? All right, I am not hearing any motion um, at that point. So to me, that uh, says that um, his current status of uh, disability retirement is intact, um, and um, and the and the and that we conclude that he is disabled. Um, so, if there's no other comments, um, I want to thank um, Mr. Hassan and and Mr. Boyle um, for your time. You know, over the last pretty much the last year or so, going through this process. Um, and uh, if there's any other um, parting comments, um, please speak up. 
I just want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the board for their due consideration. Uh, thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. All right, so let's, um, we'll go ahead and, and transition um, back to our agenda and go to the next item. Give me one second here. <laughs> All right, so we are on um, uh, 2.0 consent calendar. Um, Staff, are you able to figure out where that's coming from, coming from and mute them by any chance? Right, it looks, like they dropped, looks like they dropped off. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I'll be leaving the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Russ. So uh, uh, 2.0 consent calendar. Um, is there anything on here that um, you guys would like to be pulled for discussion? Mr. Chair, motion to approve the consent calendar. All right, we got a motion by Santos. Second. I'll second it. So motion by uh, Santos, second by Gardiner. All in favor, roll call. Drew Lanza. Let's see, I think Drew, Drew, I knew Drew had a drop off, so he might have dropped off. Um, Howard Lee. Yes. Ezra Menon. Aye. Nick Muyo. Aye. Richard Santos. Yes. Zunita. Yes. Events. Aye. Franco. Aye. And Gardner. Aye. Ado. All right. Consent calendar passed. Um, let's go to item three investments 3A oral update from CIO. A retirement service, Prabhu Palani. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're going to have a, we have a short investment agenda uh, this morning. And uh, but before we get to that, just a couple of numbers that I would like to share with the board. Our fiscal year-to-date returns are in, and uh, the police and fire plan returned three point one percent. And uh, and we also have estimates from Makita for July 2020, which is 3.45% on the back of very strong markets. And uh, as you all know, we've had two crazy quarters. Uh, the first quarter, there was a big meltdown in the markets and the equity markets, strong bounce back in the second quarter. And the boards did a phenomenal job of moving very quickly to increase our equity beta, as a result of which our calculations show that we have actually gotten an additional 170 basis points for the year. So had we not made the move that we did in March, our returns would have been lower by 1.7%. So kudos to the board for moving very quickly. Now, uh, there's one more statistic, one more data point that I would like to share. Now I have always contended that we don't have peers. And our long serving trustees have also been of the same opinion. Why is that so? Because we are an outlier when it comes to California public plans. And you've heard Bill Hallmark say that. We are an extremely leveraged plan. We are a very mature plan. And what that means is that a decade from now, we are going to have huge outflows from the plan. And therefore, we have positioned our portfolio somewhat conservatively. And this is not true of so many other public pension plans out there, and each one is very unique. And therefore, peer comparisons don't all, always make sense. Uh, but I realize that our stakeholders uh, don't have as nuanced an understanding of the plan, and they, will, they often compare us to our peers. And we all know the story in the last decade, we've been in the bottom decile of the investor force greater than 1 billion. But fortunately, because of our defensive stance, as the pandemic unfolded and markets you know, came down sharply, 
uh, we were protected somewhat compared to a lot of our peers. And because we moved so swiftly, we also participated in a lot of the upside following that. And therefore, we, the, the, the appropriate benchmark for us, which we've always used on a peer relative basis is we compare ourselves to the investor force greater than 1 billion public plan universe. Now you may have seen some numbers in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, which is a different universe, which is even the smaller plans, which often do not have private assets. So this universe is not complete yet, but Makita informs me that, you know, there's a total of 60 peers, um, 60 plans that participate in that universe and 49 of them have reported. And we've actually, for the fiscal year, uh, ending June 30th, 2020, we actually uh, finished in the 20th percentile. And for the calendar year to date, we finished in the 11th percentile. So that's good news for those who care about peer relative performance. And I just wanted to share that with the board. And I know our stakeholders are always interested in that. Uh, so again, 3.1% is short of our target rate of 6.75%. But our target rate is not intended to be an annual target. It's, it's supposed to be a return that we achieve over, the long period, over a long period of time. Uh, so given where we were in March, uh, I'm actually quite happy that we, we finished at 3.1% and continued with a very strong July of 3.45%. Uh, with that, uh, we do have, uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but we also have Steve McCourt on the line with us uh, from Makita to get his perspective on the markets and anything else that he's seeing out there with public plans. Uh, let's see, Steve, are you there? Yep, uh, thanks, Prabhu. Please. Um, Great, uh, thanks. I'll, I'll just spend just a couple of minutes uh, providing uh, brief updates on the markets and then I'll hand it over to, uh, happy to answer questions first of all, then I'll hand it over to, uh, to Chris to go through the private market uh, reports today. Um, so uh, the markets are just becoming increasingly challenging to, um, to uh, uh, understand as the uh, pandemic uh, continues. And so I just wanted to highlight some interesting um, observations and stats uh, regarding the markets and maybe provide a little clarity on uh, what seems to be driving the markets um, today. Uh, first of all, uh, if we roll the clock back 12 months to uh, early August 2019, uh, we had an economy uh, growing uh, a little over 2% on a, on a fairly persistent basis. We had unemployment less than 4% uh, in the economy. Uh, corporate earnings uh, were growing uh, single digits, but uh, pretty um, uh, persistent growth in corporate earnings. And of course, we had massive uh, 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 share buybacks from corporations uh, in the stock market. Uh, uh, it was as, as good as it gets for stocks 12 months ago, or so we thought. Uh, today, uh, we're just coming off a quarter where uh, GDP shrank. Um, at an annualized 35% level, um, a, a level that was uh, unmatched any point in time since the Great Depression. Uh, we've had something like 18 consecutive weeks or more now of uh, jobless claims over a million uh, people, uh, unemployment somewhere in the mid-teens, uh, depending on how you want to calculate it. And uh, challenges with uh, returning to work amidst the um, uncertainties related to the, the buyouts. Uh, we're seeing you know, corporate uh, bankruptcies and defaults. Uh, corporate earnings have um, obviously fallen off a cliff. Um, and of course, uh, in this world, uh, in the context of all that, in the trailing 12 months, uh, the U.S. stock market is up 20%. So if nothing else, uh, this teaches us all that timing the market is really, really challenging because the market does not always reflect what's going on uh, in the economy. Um, and uh, um, so, so if not reflecting what's going on in the economy, what is it reflecting? Uh, it's really reflecting two things um, right now. Uh, one is uh, the, the extraordinarily high degree of stimulus that's been provided by both the central bank and the federal government in March, and the expectation that tomorrow uh, a similar amount of uh, stimulus will be continued for the next uh, six months or so. 
um, which more or less takes off the table uh, catastrophic outcomes for the economy uh, in the near uh, in the near term. Uh, the market's also pricing in um, the likely real reality of extraordinarily low interest rates for a very very long time. Um, uh, while the stock market's been up, uh, the bond market uh, uh, continues to price bonds at lower and lower rates. Treasury bonds today are yielding about 54 basis points. Um, uh, they were up around 2% at the beginning of, of this year. So a dramatic drop in bond yields uh, uh, going out 10 years. And so uh, in the context of an expectation of very, very low interest rates, I, um, one could uh, quite easily put money into stocks uh, because how much worse could they do than bonds over the next 10 years when bonds are yielding 54 basis points. Uh, and so it's uh, in our industry, it's, it's referred to as stretching for yield. Uh, when the central bank reduces the yield on, on safe, secure bond instruments, the prices of all risky assets that yield a return more go way up. And, and that's part of what supported the, um, the stock market today. So the, the market supported by a combination of uh, stimulus from the government uh, and expe expectations of additional stimulus uh, and very low levels of interest rates. So if one were to look at things that could cause the market to crumble in the future, it would be either of those two uh, supports um, uh, uh, eroding. Um, the final thing I, I want to highlight uh, in terms of observation is just it's more of a longer term um, uh, dynamic within the markets. As we entered this uh, pandemic uh, during 2019, we started to see a lot of the same valuation gaps expand that we saw in the late 1990s. The difference in valuations between large cap and small cap stocks, between growth stocks and value stocks, between U.S. stocks and international stocks the same dynamic we saw for three or four years in a row in the late 90s, we started to see in 2019. And uh, because of the nature of this pandemic, uh, all of those uh, relationships have amplified uh, this year uh, because of the assumption that the longer the pandemic lasts, um, the more uh, successful uh, companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and the big technology names will be. So um, there has been a um, incredibly noteworthy dispersion in uh, investment outcomes between growth in technology stocks and value stocks, which is worth knowing as a board. This is not a, uh, the, the, the stock market for most of the last 18 years um, since the, the internet bubble burst um, traded somewhat monolithically. There wasn't a lot of difference between small and large cap stocks or growth and value stocks. That has changed. And so when you look at relative performance of your portfolio and what's driving the stock market, there's, there's increasingly big differences uh, between uh, growth and value in, in large and small stocks. Um, and to, to highlight sort of how extreme that's gotten, uh, the, the five largest stocks uh, in the world uh, um, are in the U.S. stock market, um, three of which are headquartered within a few miles of San Jose. Uh, uh, Facebook and Apple and uh, Google and, uh, and then two up in Seattle, Microsoft and Amazon. Um, those five companies together uh, now have a market value that exceeds the market value of any country's stock market outside the U.S. And so I just highlight that to highlight the, the, the future expectations that investors are placing on these large uh, technology companies. Um, and uh, 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 not with any sort of recommendation for action, but really just um, uh, incredible observation of uh, the, 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 the things that we're seeing in the market today. Um, I'll finish by just saying, uh, you know, uh, congratulations on the really nice year. I'll echo Prabhu's comments that um, uh, 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 this board uh, did a um, phenomenal job of acting in a really, really difficult time to move money into equities. Uh, and if, if Prabhu's estimates are, are, are even remotely close to accurate in terms of the value added to the, to the fund, that's a massive, massive um, uh, uh, advantage um, that you created for your, your fund. So congratulations um, on that. Uh, I think one of the, the great elements of 
that move and, and sort of the, the culture that Prabhu has uh, continued here is thinking about asset allocation uh, in a long-term way, very methodically. And, um, and so while the, the, the benefit happened to work in a very short-term time frame, that's, um, that's great. Uh, I, I would emphasize that asset allocation is a long-term game and it's worth continuing to um, evaluate, you know, each and every year the, the dynamics of asset allocation and its impact on the fund. So with that, I'll shut up and uh, leave it to any questions. All right, thank you. Prabhu, did you any, have any follow-up questions or comments? <clears throat> Uh, no, Andrew, again, I'm also happy to take on questions before we move on to Chris. Okay. The, <clears throat> if anybody has any questions, you know, for either one of them, uh, just go ahead and please speak up. Andrew, I, I have a couple questions, but I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time. Um, it, a, it has to do with our investment portfolio as it relates to real estate and any concerns about the commercial real estate market as we move into, as we exist in a virtual wor uh, world, and as commercial tenants are indicating that they may be giving up some of their leases and that may affect property values. Additionally, there's state legislation that if it's passed could force the real estate market, both residential and commercial to plummet in uh, California. So are we uh, looking at that? And, and if so, how much of our asset allocation is vested in uh, real estate investment trusts, as an example, and, and others? Thank you. Uh, hey, coming from that world, I'm very concerned about that. Council Member Foley, uh, you know, obviously we can answer that at a high level and we can give you details at a later time, but it also gives me a chance to put uh, on the spot, one of my most talented investment officers, if he's online, Dinesh. <laughs> Hi, this is Dinesh from the investment staff. So this is actually something that we've been following very closely. And it seems every week, every month, there's more developments on the future of real estate and how that's going to impact different property types. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, for office demand, there's going to be significant impacts on uh, the future usage. But also there's new opportunities as social distancing gets incorporated into offices where more space is being allocated to each individual. And even when there's an or rotation of maybe half the staff coming in on a certain day, they're not necessarily reducing the total number of desks. So there's still a lot yet to be seen on the office space, uh, something that we're tracking closely and watching for the different trends, how companies are allocating their space and how uh, our real estate investment managers are operating. And similarly for the apartment space, there's been changes as people move away from the cities into suburbs, and it's still early on to track these trends, but uh, something that certainly being monitored for our portfolio. And to answer your specific question on the real estate investment trust, we actually don't have any exposure to publicly traded real estate investment trusts. We do have exposure to all the primary property types, including office, multifamily, industrial, and retail. And what we've found is that the property types that are faring the worst so far are retail, uh, as people have shifted more towards uh, shopping online. And it's created an opportunity for the industrial warehouse market, which we have recently allocated additional capital to and has been an area of focus for our real estate portfolio to, to do well. Uh, the other area that's been hurting a lot is hotels, as many hotels have been shut down and there's uncertainty on when new conventions will start up again and how much people are willing to uh, travel for business purposes. There has been some improvement already on the leisure travel where people are looking to take a vacation that's somewhere drivable and some of those uh, occupancy rates are coming back for things that are closer to different things like national parks. So another area that, that's being monitored, but uh, happy to take any other specific questions. Great, that is actually really, really helpful. There is some state legislation pending that I'm very concerned about how that will affect all real estate types uh, as it um, relates to forgiveness or forbearance of mortgage payments. And uh, the reason I'm concerned is 
not about the forbearance, but how that will have an impact on our banks and the ability of uh, capital in the lending market in the state of California if that legislation passes. It's proceeding through the Senate right now. Uh, I don't have the Senate number. Maybe we can watch that and see how that's going to affect us, but it's going, if that's passed, it will affect credit availability in California, and then it will affect real estate values of all types. Thanks, that's a great point, and we'll monitor that as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Andrew, uh, if I may ask uh, Stephen a question. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I said, Stephen, uh, thank you for your presentation, some interesting ideas. So, you know, one of the things, you know, I guess as custodians of pension, um, you know, you worry about risk. Um, and as, you know, the QE, various versions, uh, debt levels, government debt levels increase, not just in the US, but globally, um, you know, what, you know, you're kind of increasing the fragility of the system in many ways. I mean, you know, what are the concerns that your, you know, other clients talk about in terms of, you know, a repeat of a crisis, a more prolonged crisis, the inability of the governments to do more because they've kind of done everything they can. Um, but what, what, what are the things that you hear about as, as concerns? Yeah, I, I, think, I think all the concerns expressed boil down to kind of a single data point, which is low interest rates. Um, the the um, the capacity for governments to provide fiscal and monetary support one could quite argue is unlimited, uh, and Japan has taught us that. Uh, the um, you know this this year uh, the the U.S. federal government has enacted deficit spending that is you know multiples of anything that that we've ever experienced before here in the US. And in the face of that, interest rates have fallen from 2% to 0.5%. Um, Europe uh, just announced its first, uh, in essence, Euro bond, uh, which will allow um, the, the whole European Union to borrow capital from the capital markets. Um, and of course, they're borrowing at an effective 0% rate as well. So we seem to be in a, in a place, whether people like it or not, where central banks uh, are willing and able to purchase more or less unlimited amounts of government bonds. Uh, and is in the market, more importantly, believes that they will continue to do that. So as long as there's a belief that central banks will buy bonds that are issued by governance, um, there's no upward pressure on interest rates, which would normally be sort of the market clearing mechanism for government borrowing. So uh, it's possible that we see uh, kind of a change in philosophy from major central banks around the world. Uh, and that would certainly be a cause for concern with rates uh, rising. Uh, but as we stand here today, uh, all of the near term uh, signaling from central banks is that they continue to want to buy more and more. And they continue to communicate that fiscal governments need to do more and more to provide support for the economy. So where that leaves us is uh, um, a global economy where government debt outstanding increases a lot. Uh, interest rates stay very, very low because an increasing portion of that debt is held by central banks. And, uh, and that may very well be the state of affairs for the next decade or more. It's uh, the, the, in our history, the closest analogy to the current state of affairs is, is World War II, where we took on massive amounts of debt and it was financed by the central bank. And we had low interest rates till about 1968 um, after World War II, despite a couple of uh, bouts of inflation and lots of business cycles. So um, I think the, 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 uh, the biggest concern for defined benefit plans are low interest rates, long-term low interest rates, because the return expectations of every asset class that is investable rest on top of the return of the risk-free asset, which is the long-term treasury bond. So when long-term treasury bonds go down by a percent and a half, which they have this year roughly, that
that means the expected return of most other asset classes goes down by a percent and a half. And it forces long-term investors to think about what their return expectations, you know, truly should be. And I think that's the the big picture challenge facing endowments, facing uh, institutional pension plans, and facing individual uh, retirees. Um, the 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 forward-looking returns, um, uh, and it seems like I keep repeating myself because I've said this probably four out of the last five years, keep getting lower and lower because interest rates keep. Uh, falling, and I think the solutions that people have to that are 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 um, varied, and uh, um, uh, in some cases may seem um, extreme. In the case of you know some plans looking at leverage as a way to uh, elevate returns, um, but I but I think those are just uh, uh, natural reactions to the reality that the world faces of extraordinarily extraordinarily low interest rates. Thank you. Thank you, Esmar. Um, Prabhu, did you um, want to just jump right into the other one or do you have follow-up comments? No, thank you, Andrew. If there are no questions, we will move to the next uh, item. Thank you, Steve, for your comments and your presentation. Um, Laura Weirich is on vacation uh, this week, so we'll have Chris Theodore presenting uh, our private markets report. As you all know, uh, the Newberger piece was actually presented at the last meeting. Uh, the rest of it was not ready, and the, this is a dated report going back to the end of last calendar year. Uh, but with that, I will turn this over to Chris. Thank you, Prabhu. I'm going to share my screen in an effort to pull up the report. Are you all able to do that? Yes, we are. Awesome. So we'll be speaking on the private markets program public report as of fourth quarter 2019. Uh, as a reminder, we do provide uh, a slightly more detailed version to staff that is non-public, which details some of the investment performance for some of the underlying managers. Uh, through December 31st, 2019, uh, the retirement plan had committed capital of roughly one and a half uh, billion dollars and contributed a little over a billion dollars towards that program. Uh, you see that this program consists of legacy private equity, Newberger's Fund of One, private debt, real estate, and real assets. Uh, a new component of this report is on the far right-hand side. We have added in a PME IRR. Uh, PME stands for Public Market Equivalent. Uh, and PME is helpful in gauging a private market asset class's return compared to what you would have achieved in the public markets if investing in the same space. Uh, so you'll see that your, both of your private equity investments, legacy private equity and Newberger Fund of One have nicely outperformed their PME IRR. Uh, private debt has slightly underperformed, real estate has outperformed and real assets have slightly under, underperformed. Flipping through uh, here to page three, we'll start our comments on the private debt program. Uh, as of December 31st, the retirement plan had committed $529.5 million to 11 partnerships and one separately managed co-investment. Uh, this represents roughly 4.3% of the overall retirement plan. Um, as a reminder, the target for private debt was 4% as of the end of the year. Um, but in March of 2019, uh, due to the special actions um, and enhancing the growth bucket, which have been beneficial to the retirement program, uh, the private credit allocation was reduced to 3%. We'll note that on page four here that there were no, no new commitments to the private debt program. Uh, and we'll also note that uh, the program is quite mature, where distributions significantly outpace contributions in the plan. In the fourth quarter of 2019, there were roughly 20 and a half, 21 and a half million in distributions, while contributions were roughly six and a half million. Uh, we do detail uh, each of the vintage years, as well as the, the uh, underlying strategies. Um, were there any questions here on private debt before we continue through to real assets? Hearing none, we'll jump into private assets where as of the end of the fourth quarter, 
the plan had committed $59.2 million to five real assets funds. Um, this equates to roughly 1% of the retirement plan versus a 3% target policy. Uh, when we look at the components of, of the real assets program, uh, this is you know a much newer plan for the program um, with contributions starting in 2016. Uh, so we see the real assets program calling capital and staff evaluating uh, new opportunities in order to, to call up to the 3% target in the retirement plan. Distributions within the plan represented roughly $1.8 million uh, in the fourth quarter, uh, while contributions were roughly 700,000. Uh, there were no new commitments in the fourth quarter here for real assets. We'll note that real assets pricing um, you know, was quite strong in the fourth quarter of 2019 was a subject of much focus in 2020. Uh, the price of oil particularly ended 2019 at roughly $67 a barrel. If we're looking at WTI oil uh, in 2020, uh, you know, there were several market dynamics due to the spread of COVID-19 that saw oil briefly trade negative um, and has since rebounded up into the 40s. Um, so quite a volatile period uh, for oil here in 2020. Um, and we'll note that this report is dated as of 2019. But if we look at the real assets program, the majority of investments are in, invested in infrastructure plants, um, as you'll see here detailed uh, by Vintage and Strategy. Um, whereas when we talk about that private, uh, the public markets equivalent, uh, we use the Dow Jones US, uh, the Dow Jones Brookfield infrastructure when evaluating the public market equivalent due to the majority of the plan being invested in infrastructure investments at this point. We'll jump forward to real estate here on page 13. As of December 31st, the plan had committed 256.1 million to 16 real estate funds. Uh, this equates to 2.8% of the overall retirement plan versus a 3% policy target uh, to echo on Trustee Foley's uh, question earlier as to the percentage that the retirement plan is allocated toward real estate. Uh, there is roughly 5% of the, of the program uh, allocated towards uh, core real estate, whereas 3% here is towards private market real estate. So roughly 8% total. There were two new commitments in the fourth quarter uh, for real estate totaling roughly $20 million, uh, both uh, concentrated in North America. That would be Exeter 5 and Rock Point 6. Uh, we see quarterly cash flows in the fourth quarter represented uh, a little over $4 million in distributions and a little bit over $5 million in contributions. Uh, to echo Dinesh's comments on the real estate market, we've seen occupancy rates and rent collections be quite resilient here throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we understand that this report is a bit dated as of December 31st, 2019, um, but we would expect your real estate portfolio to be down in the low single digits uh, here through the first quarter of 2020, uh, much of which uh, is bolstered, as Steve had mentioned, by lower interest rates. Uh, lower interest rates um, do contribute to, to the upward value in real estate market here um, and have been you know, a nice tailwind for your real estate market, uh, even though it's been a quite a stressful time period for real estate. That concludes our planned comments here on the private markets program. Happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Um, I believe Drew's already dropped, dropped off. Um, Howard, do you have any comments, questions? Um, I just, uh, I actually just have one, uh, actually two questions, and, and maybe this was an obvious answer. What, when is the next uh, next set of uh, financials or plan out? Because this is end of December. And then the second question is, uh, with the uh, new investment in um, Lime Rock New Energy, I assume that's going to be in this in the real assets program where Lime Rock already exists? Yes, that's correct. So we have planned presentations for the September meetings for your first quarter reports. Uh, we'll note this first quarter report, uh, this fourth quarter report was a bit delayed uh, due to the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, managers are working from home. They have a stipulated longer time period for the fourth quarter financials in order to produce those. Um, 
So given the timeline that they had and the shift to work from home for many of these firms, uh, we didn't receive numbers for quite a long time period. And then also there was no July meeting as well. Uh, so that kind of contributes here to, to the dated report in front of you today. Um, but we expect to be back on track here for the September meetings. Uh, we, were, we would present first quarter 2020 private markets reports and second quarter public markets. Uh, Chris, let me interrupt real quick. Chris, uh, private market reports are typically six months delayed, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you, Chris. Uh, good job. Thank you. Uh, Eswar, do you have any questions? Yeah, hey, Chris. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So quick question, um, you know, I expect as the year progresses uh, that, you know, the COVID unfriendly sectors, you know, hospitality, um, um, you know, uh, property, you know, rental properties, things like that, that maybe have problems. You know, on the private debt side, what exposure we have to those kinds of sectors? Aircraft leasing, you know, those kinds of sectors. In order to get into the specifics of each of the managers, um, we, you know, we would invite some staff comments at four to enter closed session. Um, That's fine. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll bring sure. it. Thank uh, you. I have no problem speaking broadly if if, if that works for you. Um, yeah. So uh, certainly across uh, our private debt and private markets programs, we have exposure to some of the industries that have been most impacted. Um, obviously, we present the uh, kind of main structure like a real estate investment is generally in real estate uh, with respect to things like aircraft leasing uh, we we don't have exposure directly to that within our private debt program that's um, something we have evaluated and just never <coughs> felt the need to to add um, within some of these these managers both in private debt and in, in probably to a lesser extent in real estate and in private equity we can see second order effects so perhaps we don't own a hotel within our private debt portfolio, but you know there there's very likely an organization in one of the managers that might own something related to oil and gas that could be marked down. And yeah. similar, we could see some you know healthcare effects in the private equity portfolio. So um, you know when we're making manager recommendations and thinking about diversification mm -hmm. in the portfolio, we are also considering that. Um, but that's why you see some correlation between private markets, even when they're not uh, directly in impacted in industries. Okay, yeah, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Chris, that's all. Actually, if I could just jump in as a follow-up on this page. So these, <coughs> are these mostly senior tranches of, of CLOs and credit funds? Uh, they are not, uh, and, and I think that Given your background, you might be interested in having an offline discussion about how we uh, ap approach the securitized segments of, of private credit. Yeah. yeah, you read my mind, but the, the, the sizable chunks, that's why I was curious. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Nick, do you have any questions? Uh, no, thank you for the uh, presentation. No questions. Santos. No, thank you. A lot of good information. Thank you. Vince. No questions. Franco. He's on mute. Um, uh, Sunita, did you have any other questions? Yeah, I, mean, I was just curious about the infrastructure piece of this. Um, and again, we can follow up offline. I'm, I'm still educating myself, but um, is there much risk associated with COVID in that part of the portfolio? That is a very interesting question. I think it depends on who you would ask. I suspect if you speak to an infrastructure manager, they will tell you about the resiliency of the assets they, they own. I think if you speak to a highly skeptical negative person like myself, you would might hear that uh, when GDP falls, infrastructure will be significantly impacted, particularly if there's significant leverage at the asset level. Yeah, because most of the stimulus has been monetary, not only fiscal. So anyway, we can follow up offline. All right, and I don't have any further questions. Um, so probably unless you have any follow-up um, comments on the presentation, um, I think we could wrap this one up. Yeah, nothing further, Andrew. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Very welcome.
All right, so we are on to 3C, um, discussion and approval for the um, secretary to negotiate and execute a three-year extension of the agreement with JP Morgan for emerging market debt benchmark data for 10,000 per year shared 50-50 with Federated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with your permission, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna turn this over to Ron, but ask Ron to uh, address both those items. Uh, firstly, JP Morgan and then uh, Bara as well. Okay. And they're very similar. And Ron, take it away. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, so I'll take items C and D together, and then, since they're similar. Uh, so this is administrative uh, approval request uh, for JP Morgan, it's they provide index data for benchmarking purposes for emerging market debt strategies. And for VIRA, I'm sorry, for BARA, BARA provides uh, an, an, a risk analysis data for the risk analysis system. And um, it's, uh, it's part of the system that we use with VIRAS. And since this is a separate contract, uh, we are bringing this forward as a separate uh, approval. And both of these contracts are shared 50-50 with, uh, with Federated. So the total amount is shown here. With that, I'll take any questions. All right. Um, Howard, do you have any questions on either one of these, C or D? Uh, just one, one question with respect to uh, Barra and Barris, and maybe this is just, I'm not familiar. Um, have there been uh, alternatives explored in the past uh, prior to the contracts of Veris of Vara where one or the other could supply or uh, other groups that can supply both the data as well as the analysis? Yeah, Trustee Lee, uh, yes, we have mm -hmm. actually explored that. And uh, so what happened in 2017 is uh, Vara was actually rolled into the Veris contract and uh, so for three years, it was approved with an annual extension. And uh, once we had David on board as a risk manager, uh, we, I've asked David to look at other options. And so we thought it's appropriate to actually separate this out from Veris. And so even though we do get the Bara data through Veris, the contract is still with Bara directly. And the same amount of fee was what was paid in the last three years and that continues and we are exploring other options. We've seen other uh, risk analytics like uh, Bl BlackRock's Aladdin's a little, a little bit more expensive. Uh, we've seen uh, Northfield, I'm very familiar with Axioma, and they're all around the same ballpark. So this is not to say that the Barra system is the best, uh, but we continue to explore uh, if we can find better alternatives. Okay, all right, great, well, thank you. Uh, S.Y.R., do you have any questions? I don't, Andrew. All right, thank you. Uh, Nick. No, sir. Santos. No, and a motion to approve. All right, got that motion. Uh, Sunita. Yeah, I'm just curious, is this data used by the in-house team or is it for the consultants? This is for the CIO and his staff. And risk analytics in addition to what the consultants might do. Okay. That's right. <clears throat> Maybe this is a follow up to uh, see what, why is there duplication? Yeah. No, uh, the, even if we do use uh, any, like for example, Veris is our risk consultant and they don't have access to Bara directly. So we do use Bara through Veris, but we have to pay Bara directly. Okay, so the risk consultants are using the Bara subscription of That's the fund to run right. your analytics. That's right. Okay, thank you. Nothing else. Vince. No questions. Franco. No questions. All right, I got no questions. Um, Harvey, can can we do uh, one motion for both of these, or should we do them separate? I'd recommend you do them separate. All right. So we'll go ahead and do two motions. Um, uh, I heard a motion from Santos, I assume for C, correct? Yes, uh, and, and B. And D. Okay. 
Um, so a motion on, on C to negotiate um, with JP Morgan for emerging mm -hmm. uh, market debt benchmark to up to 10,000 per year shared 50-50. So we had a motion by uh, Trustee Santos. Do I have a second? Howard, second. Howard, second. All right, any uh, public, any comments? All right, no public comments. Uh, do roll call vote. Uh, Drew Lanza, I believe he's, he's gone already. Um, Howard Lee. Yes. Eswar Menon. Aye. Nick Muyo. Aye. Uh, Richard Santos. Yes. Junita Ganapati. This is for B, right? Not C. Uh, sorry, it's for C. I'm sorry, C. The J. J. P. Morgan? Oh, yeah. Aye. Aye. Um, Vincent Seri. Aye. Frank Ovato. Aye. And myself, aye. All right, that, that passes uh, 8 0 with one absent. All right, let's move to um, item D, discussion and approval. So uh, there was a motion by uh, Santos um, for D, approval of the secretary to negotiate and execute a two-year extension of the agreement with BARA um, for up to 157500 per year shared with Federated. Do I have a second? Muyo, second. Second by Muyo. Any uh, public comment? I'd be curious about the um, the costs that we spend on analytics. It can rise up a lot, and you know, one of the questions that came up when uh, at the council when I was interviewing the council in talks was uh, I'd love to follow up with. I don't have an objection, but I don't I don't know how to sort of phrase this. And, and this you were in and out. I don't know, probably, were you able to hear the question clearly? No, I wasn't. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. I think the question is, how does this stack up versus the overall uh, cost spent on analytics? You know, those can really go up a lot. And uh, I know the city council is concerned about costs. I think that's the impression I got during my interview. So I'd love to follow up. I'm not, I'm not going to object to the approval, but I certainly do would like some analysis around the costs around risk analytics from Prabhu's team. Did yeah. you hear me? The, the cost has remained the same in the last three years for BARA. It has not gone up. And we do, we do present to the city council a comprehensive report in the fall that shows all costs of the pension system. All right. No objection, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we had a second on Muyo. Um, I don't think I heard any other public comments. Um, so let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Drew Lanza is absent. Um, uh, Howard. Yes. Eswar. Aye. Nick. Aye. Santos. Yes. Danita. Aye. Vince. Aye. Franco. Aye. And myself <laughs> here, I uh, pass 8 0 with one absent. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, so we have no going to item four. We have no old business. Continue, so we'll go straight to item 5A oral date update from CEO of Retirement Services, Roberto. Thank you, Andrew. I hope that everyone can hear me. Uh, welcome back. I hope that you all have a good uh, July. So I'll try to keep my comments to uh, about two or three minutes uh, because I would like to offer time to counsel uh, Harvey Lederman to give you a concise summary of the recent decision by the California Supreme Court on the um, on the issues related to, maybe I'm mis speaking here, counsel, but uh, I know it touches on the vested benefits and California rule to some extent. So I know you'll speak more about it, but uh, just, just to make sure that you have the time so that the board can ask questions. So quickly, you may have noticed that the agenda um, for the board meeting uh, this morning is uh, being revised, and, and that is work that the departments are doing with the, uh, with the city and the city clerk. And is revised due to the COVID-19 to provide more transparency to public uh, members and stakeholders of uh, these uh, virtual meetings. 
um, uh, from time to time, I reach out to both boards to let you know uh, by email, but I wanted to share with you that business is going on as usual at the retirement office. Um, staff continue working remotely, and uh, we are obviously completing our core duties. So we're still retiring the members, accepting retirement applications. Uh, the retiree payroll is completed timely and accurately. We are paying vendors. Obviously, as you can tell, we are scheduling the board and committee meetings. And so uh, business is continuing. And the truth is that um, my suspicion is that this is gonna go for a longer time than we anticipated. And there's always a good chance that um, staff may not even get back to the office until the 2021, but uh, that remains to be seen. And to, I think to that extent, uh, the, uh, the city also has been reaching out to the departments across the city uh, regarding considerations of returning the, to work plan for the various departments. And I think one of the issues that have been raised is, you know, this is going to continue for some time. And so the ability of uh, staff to check out office equipment uh, to continue uh, working from home. So we have uh, developed uh, uh, forms for the staff to do so. In fact, uh, you should know that uh, we had a meeting and we're going to be of senior staff, but we also are going to have a, our quarterly staff meeting with all the staff later this month. Uh, but the key issue is that as we expect the uh, returning to the office uh, work is going to continue to possibly the end of the year, um, we are considering uh, getting laptops for, uh, for uh, the staff uh, so that they can uh, not only get updated computers, but they can work from home. And when we are ready to get back to the office, uh, whatever that happens, obviously that will be the computer, the desktop that they will use at the office as well. And it will allow staff uh, going forward to have more flexibility between working at home and working at the office. Um, I also wanted to remind you, and I apologize, some of you may not know what this means, but there is a not known conflict of interest form that each one of you file every year. That's usually during September. The staff will be reaching out to all of you about the form. And of course, those of you that are fairly new to the board, we will make sure that um, we explain uh, the request and what exactly is it that the form uh, requires uh, of each one of you. Uh, I also wanted to publicly uh, thank um, our uh, city liaison, uh, Sherry Parkman. Uh, she worked tirelessly um, through the city, the boards and CalPERS to, to get the CalPERS defined benefit plan not only approved by the city council, which both board uh, appreciate, and we thank the council for doing so, but also to, from an administrative standpoint, to, to get it into place. And so uh, I also wanted to publicly thank both boards uh, for your support and especially former chair for police and fire, Vincent Seri, and the former chair for Federated, uh, Matt Lodge, and, and their work to push this uh, forward. And so finally, uh, the defined benefit plan was put into place for our investment professionals on June 26th which means the first contributions to the CARPERS uh, defined benefit plan will be on the August 14th paycheck. Uh, and at the same time, when that happens, then they will no longer be making contributions to the 401A plan. So thank you, Sherry, for your work. Uh, and lastly, I just wanted to let you know that um, I issued an email early this week. Uh, there was a San Jose Spotlight article that uh, it was more related as to the implications of COVID to the impact of the city and their budget, but it, do, it did touch on the implications to both plans. And again, both Prabhu and I were interviewed. I hope that you all had a chance to look at the article, but if you have any questions, uh, please share them with us. Uh, with that, I, I don't have any more comments. I'm happy to entertain any questions or answer any questions you may have. And uh, again, if you don't have any of the comments, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, council to give you a summary on the recent California Supreme Court decisions. Thank you, uh, Chair Academia. And Andrew, if we, before we get into Harvey's report, would it be possible for me to give my report um, 
because I need to go off camera shortly and I'd love to be able to do that, but I do want to listen to Harvey too. I think we, what he has to say will be very uh, informative. Um, Harvey, would you be able to accommodate that? I, I waived the superior bumping rights. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome uh, Councilwoman Pam Foley. Thank um, you, Harvey, I appreciate that, I'm grateful. <laughs> Just so you know, I had knee surgery, so it's not, it's hard for me to sit here. I have to get up and move around occasionally. Um, so we, we did pass our budget in June. Uh, as you all know, uh, it required a lot of belt tightening and may uh, very likely require more belt tightening in uh, August and September as the results of COVID uh, are not waning. They're, they're uh, becoming more impactful. And we had a presentation at our recent city council meeting that we will be in this position for another six months likely. So uh, be prepared to be working remotely and having these virtual meetings for a, a long, long time. We did uh, uh, vote to put two ballot measures, uh, two measures on the ballot in November both are charter amendments, so they require that they be uh, voted on by the general public. The first one, uh, re the first one relates to our card rooms, that we expand the number of uh, tables allowed to 30, that would be 15 each at Matrix and Bay 101, and to increase the tax that we collect from the card rooms. That has a substantial increase in uh, budget or it will when the card rooms can open up again because the card rooms are not open um, as we know that's one of the businesses that have been impacted by COVID but uh, when they opened up this will increase the taxes to I think it's 16.5 percent from 15 percent I could be could be wrong about this the details the other ballot measure relates is three items that are we're uh, putting into one and the reason that we have just two ballot measures and not four ballot measures is really a uh, fiscal reason. Every time you add a ballot measure, the first one costs us 1.6 million, the second one 600,000 each. So we're able to combine three that we think go together. The, the three are related to the census under uh, state law or require, or by our charter, we're required to convene a, um, redistricting panel and with discussions and decisions to be made and submitted to the council within a certain amount of time. But if the census is late, we still have to respond as if the census was delivered to us and the detail was delivered on time. We suspect because of COVID that this, the census will be late. And so the charter amendment will allow us to do our work next year within a timely manner. It just gives us some flexibility the other is relation, related to the Planning Commission. We currently have seven members who serve on the Planning Commission. There's been very uh, uh, long discussions about diversity in the representation on the count on Planning Commission and diversity is related to having uh, representatives from each city council district. Uh, and it, currently we, we have a provision that allows for two uh, you can have as many as two uh, commissioners from one particular district. This opens it up to one council member from every district, plus the mayor will appoint uh, someone also. These are not appointments. They are, these are people who will still need to submit and apply to the, the planning commission, but we will be looking at making sure we have one from every council uh, district. Um, the third item on that particular ballot measure is re related to the independent police auditor the, and, that, and reforms and increase in uh, auditing authority with the police auditor. This conforms to a side agreement with the POA and will allow us to, uh, comes directly as a result of the protests and some of the concerns about the current IPA's um, effectiveness or ability to be effective in the public eye. So, uh, but again, these are the IPA and her responsibilities and duties are part of negotiated uh, 
items with the POA and they have agreed in this, the first there was a side agreement, now we go to the, to, to the public to vote on it. Um, we did also have major discussions in June and then just the end of July about a, uh, moving the mayor's race to the presidential race. It was very contentious and approved 6-5. Then uh, when it came to the uh, actual ballot language in last week, we voted not to move it forward, but to move it to other commissions. We have uh, established a charter commission that will take a look at the charter, the duties and responsibilities of the mayor tied into the discussion was uh, discussions around an effective mayor and changes, potential changes to some of the responsibilities of the mayor. Um, many of you may know that we have a city manager who makes most of the decisions at the city. When curfew was established by, um, during the protests, the city council and mayor did really have, we had no real portion, no decision in that. We were, uh, we were informed what was going to be done at, by the city manager. That's the system that we have. The Charter Commission will take a look at whether that's a good system, whether it needs to be uh, modified or not, and uh, make recommendations. The recommendations won't come to us. Any recommendations will require changes to our charter, and that won't come back to us until uh, 2022 for a vote on the ballot in potentially, well, March or June, whenever the primary is. Uh, but that will all depend on the results of the Charter Commission. So we've had a busy couple of months, even though July was off, it uh, wasn't completely off. So with that, I'll conclude my comments. All right, thank you. While we still have her um, on and before she leaves, does uh, anybody, any trustees have any questions uh, for the councilwoman? Andrew, it's Vince, I have one question. Go ahead, Vince. So my question is during the budget discussions, I, I know the city often anticipates what the discount rate might be for these plans going forward and starts to account for those contributions. What, was there any discussion around the plan potentially changing the discount rate and lowering that? We did not discuss the discount rate or lowering it, it although in consideration of the budget and our concerns, we pre-funded our uh, contribution to the retirement fund. I think we paid that in February and we usually pay that much later in, in consideration. But of course, it's a very, uh, deep concern because that will affect our general fund and how much, how many fun, what, where we have to cut back in other areas. So we're okay for this fiscal year, but maybe not for next fiscal year. Great. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from a trustee? Thank you. Well, I will stay on. Uh, I just won't be here uh, in person. I'll be here uh, listening because I do want to hear what Harvey has to say. I think it's very, uh, it could uh, change a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Member Foley. Uh, Council Member Foley, this is uh, Roberto. I apologize. A quick second. If you could stay after the comments by, by the by Council, because the next item deals with the potential joint meeting of the boards with the city council um, agenda, it would be helpful to have you available for the discussion as well, if you can, if you if you actually can accommodate that, so. A absolutely, in, in fact, I plan to stay through that. Okay, very well, thank you, okay, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Harvey, thank you for uh, the uh, accommodations. Um, turn it back over to you. Not a problem, and thank you uh, very much. I'll try to keep this uh, brief, but um, I want to give you some detail about this case that's been uh, long anticipated. Um, this is it's titled the Alameda case. It involved three uh, county pension systems and um, how they reacted uh, to the change in the law when the legislature changed it in 2013 for not only for new members, PEPRA members have come to be known everywhere other than in charter cities like uh, San Jose uh, and legacy members um, 
which are sort of comparable to our tier one in San Jose. Uh, this case was about the uh, expectations that legacy members had for um, built up over the years in their retirement systems as to what elements of pay were going to be counted towards their final compensation and the calculation of their retirement benefits, um, including elements of pay such as on-call and standby pay, uh, of particular use uh, by a lot of safety and uh, public works type uh, individuals. Uh, a certain amount of leave cash outs, vacation and sick leave cash outs received at termination of employment. Over years, um, members had uh, and employees had built up expectations through settlement agreements and, uh, and just practices of these retirement boards that those elements would be counted uh, towards their pensionable compensation when calculating their benefits. Um, what happened was uh, sparked by Jerry Brown in 2012, uh, the legislature passed effective January of 2013, a change in the law that uh, basically said these elements of pay were no longer going to be counted towards pensions because they were essentially distorting what was the normal pay that someone earned throughout their career and they were creating behaviors where people were changing their behavior, changing the amount of money that they were getting just in their last year of, of uh, work. Uh, and it was distorting, it was considered pension spiking and the legislature closed what they called loopholes, um, allowing those things to be counted. Um, members, legacy members, equivalent to tier one, uh, filed suit against the retirement boards because the retirement boards, uh, when the new law passed in January of 2013, had no choice but to follow the new law. Um, unions representing almost all the employees of, of at least three, if not four counties, uh, brought suit against their boards saying, you know, we have contractual rights and expectations that have built up over the years and the legislature had no authority to change them because it was the state impairing our contractual rights, our vested rights to continue to have the calculation of our benefits go as we have approved them during the course of our careers. This case was actually filed in uh, November of 2012. Um, and as I've told you before, uh, I represent two of the three pension fund boards in the case. Uh, I represent Contra Costa and Alameda counties um, in those cases. And we've been waiting for this case to be resolved for literally almost eight years. Um, last week on Thursday, the California Supreme Court finally issued its opinion in the case, uh, a unanimous opinion of the court <clears throat> which is um, quite strong and, and extremely well-written and well-reasoned. Whether you like it or not, it was an extremely clear and well-written opinion by the Chief Justice. Um, and let me tell you basically what the court said and uh, then take any questions that you might have. Essentially, the court said that, yes, members had fairly and understandably relied upon agreements with their pension boards and expectations that they had with policies that these things were going to continue to be counted. Uh, but those agreements and those expectations are taken with a grain of salt. And the big grain of salt was at any time the legislature has the authority to change the law because those interpretations of including those pay elements um, were fair interpretations of what the law was at the time, but there was no understanding and no agreement and no fair belief that the legislature would not or could not change the law in the future. And so all of those uh, agreements and policies of the pension boards as to what was being counted, why
while they were reliable at the time, they came with the caveat that the legislature always had the authority to make changes. And so there was no right in the members, no contract right in the members to maintain those calculations despite the new law. And the pension boards could not be forced to continue these practices and not obey the new law. So the boards were correct. And in this case, I considered it a significant victory because we argued that our boards had absolutely no authority to disobey the law and continue practices that had previously been in place. Then the court took on the issue of the so-called California rule. Uh, the California rule being that if in fact a member's contractual vested right to a benefit was taken away or impaired by the legislature, that the legislature could only do that if a couple of things were proven. Number one, the change by the legislature has to relate to the uh, appropriate um, uh, functioning of a pension fund. Can't be for some other purpose. Can't be for a purpose, for example, of simply saving money for the state, or in the case of San Jose, saving the city money. That it has to have a material relation to the uh, to the successful operation of a pension fund. Um, second, the legislature could make changes um, only if the changes were reasonable. So the court cited other cases where they were found not to be reasonable. For example, when years ago in Kern County, when the Kern County Board of Supervisors simply ended pensions midstream, for safety officers, that was an unreasonable change. Uh, so it has to be related to the operation of the pension fund. It has to be reasonable. And if it takes away some benefit from members that they had enjoyed, some equivalent value, something to the takeaway has to be granted in exchange. And what the court said about that was, well, that's true. We have cases where, for example, uh, a COLA was taken away, but in exchange, an increased benefit formula was given. And that's okay. You can change somebody's pension, according to the Supreme Court, if you give something equivalent in exchange. But here, the court looked at the situation and said, wait a minute, what the legislature did here was trying to uh, take away pension abuse, pension spiking, and to force the legislature in order to be able to close those loopholes and, and shrink pension spiking, take away elements of pension spiking. If you're gonna force the legislature instead to give back something else of value to the members to replace what they lost through pension spiking, it defeats the very purpose of what the legislature was trying to do. So this court clarified or maybe grafted on to the California rule, that additional caveat, which is, yes, you have to give something, you ordinarily have to give something of value in exchange for what the legislature is taking away from the members, but only if it doesn't defeat the very purpose of the legitimate change that the legislature had in mind. And here the court said, closing the loopholes, pre the preventing pension abuse was a legitimate concern that relates to the operation, the successful operation of a pension fund and was reasonable. But we're not going to require the legislature to give something in exchange for taking away those added pay elements because that would defeat the entire purpose. That would reward the members for the pension spiking, so to speak, that they had engaged in. So that, that's the slight change I think there is in the so-called California rule, but the court did not overturn the California rule. 
appeal, the court breathed new life into the California rule and said, we still consider it valid and we're not going to make any changes in it. So that was the decision of the court. The court said for the three counties that are the subject of this case, we're sending you back to the trial court for rulings to be consistent with this. One of the big issues that we are facing now and that all the other county retirement systems will face as a result of this is the big question, who's this going to apply to? What members since when who have retired will now have to have their benefits recalculated? Because if somebody, for example, we have a firefighter in one jurisdiction, for example, whose base salary before retirement was about $110,000 and then got $70,000 a year in on-call pay. Had that counted, so essentially his final compensation was $180,000 and his benefit was calculated on that basis. And now the question is, do we have to go back and back out that $70,000 of on-call pay and his base benefit, become, base benefit becomes calculated on the basis of a base salary, which is $110,000. It's going to be very controversial. Uh, it's going to have a big impact on people. And the flip side of that is, well, that person paid contributions every time he got on-call pay a little piece was taken out towards retirement contributions. If that's no longer going to count, then isn't he entitled to get those contributions back? So you can imagine, I will tell you, the last time this happened was 23 years ago with something you may have heard about called the Ventura case, which increased the number of pay elements that were counted as pensionable. And we spent literally almost 20 years litigating over the meaning of that case and what has to be in and out. And now we have a new case, which leaves as many issues open for the people who are affected. And I'm expecting this will be the next 20 years of my career, uh, working on figuring out how to implement this latest Supreme Court decision. The decision becomes final um, at the end of this month, 30 days after it was rendered. Last Thursday was July 30th. So August 31st, um, after the weekend, I think that's a Monday, it becomes final. Uh, impact uh, to S San Jose, well, the, the, the PEPRA law, as I said, did not apply to charter cities that have their own pension funds. So San Jose, the, the PEPRA laws did not change anything relating to San Jose and San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, any charter city. Um, but the rule of the case, and this was a 98-page decision, by the way, a lot of reading very quickly, uh, the rule of the case is going to apply. Uh, you remember what we went through in 2014 uh, with Measure B and the aftermath and the litigation and the subsequent Measure F that came, has come down and the framework agreement. So. San Jose has been in the throes of this for the last seven years. Hopefully we have peace now uh, in San Jose and everybody knows what the rules of the road are. But this case um, indicates to plan sponsors, whether it's the city or a county or the state of California, that there may be adjustments that can be made to pension funds going forward without being concerned that they will be set aside as violating their vested rights of members. But it's all going to be very fact specific in each jurisdiction. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take this too broadly as a rule one way or the other anywhere else. I hope that's helpful um, for everybody to understand that we're happy to answer any questions let me know either now or, or offline if anybody wants a little more color on it, I'm happy to provide it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Harvey, for that explanation. Um, I know a lot of people are anticipating 
uh, this ruling for a long time and uh, your summary, uh, you really broke it down in plain English for us to understand. Um, I'll open this up to uh, trustees uh, that might have any questions for the council. So Andrew, if I may ask, um, so is this, Harvey, is this a decision for the city to make in terms of you know, changing the benefits or is it a board decision? No, uh, classically, uh, it's the, the plan of benefits is a decision made by the city through bargaining with its collective bargaining agree you know, agreements and, and, and bargaining units, but it is a the plan sponsor's decision uh, about what goes into the plan. Our job is to carry out the plan. Okay. We, we don't make the plan. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, we interpret it. Um, and Lord knows there's been a lot of interpretation issues from time to time, but no, it is the plan sponsor, in this case, the city who designs the plan and the benefits. Um, and that is subject generally to collective bargaining. Not always, but in most cases, the city will bargain with its uh, bargaining units to establish the terms of the plan. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Harvey? All right, if not, uh, thank you, Harvey. Good, you bet. Roberto, uh, I know this is still under your time. Um, do, you, do you have any, um, any further comments for uh, your report out? No, I do not. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council, for that, uh, for that explanation. Look forward to working with you for the next 20 years, just as we did 20 years ago. <laughs> All right, so that moves us to uh, 5C. Uh, discussion action on the topics for a joint meeting at the boards and city council. Um, Mr. Chair, let me, if you may, let me kick off this discussion. Um, as you know, as part of the uh, audit of the Office of Retirement Services um, by the uh, city auditor a couple of years back, one of the recommendations was, hey, maybe both boards should have an annual meeting, joint meeting with the city council. And so what you have there before you on 5C1 and 5C2 are really the agenda items for the last uh, two joint meetings in 2018 and 2019, for your reference, just so that you knew exactly what have been the topics that have been discussed over the last two years. Uh, the goal this morning, uh, right now, uh, please know we do have Cheryl Parkman uh, listening uh, and present through the Zoom meeting, uh, who is our uh, liaison for the city. Uh, currently, um, I think you all heard Council Member Foley. It looks like virtual meetings are going to continue for the rest of the year. And uh, so, this joint meeting, uh, if it takes place, it will be a joint, me a, a virtual meeting. And uh, as of today, it's not finalized, but as of today, I believe it's, it's scheduled or expected to be on Friday, uh, October 16th. And the goal of the discussion this morning is to um, provide at least a couple of topics that I can share with the city uh, as possible topics of discussion uh, for the joint meeting uh, with the city council. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll Send it over to, to, to the board for discussion with one more caveat I wanted to share, which is if it was me, I would think from the board standpoint, I would want to know from the city, which they will have a better idea in, in October, hey, how is your budget situation? Uh, what has been the COVID impact? And how do you foresee that COVID impact play out the next couple of years? And if I was the city council, I would want to hear from the boards, hey, how has the COVID-19 impacted both plans and what are the implications to the investment allocations going forward under this discount rate? To me, those are the main topics that I will strongly suggest from both sides of the equation to be discussed. And that will be, that to me, should be plenty of time for discussion. But that's just my view. I just wanted to share that. With that said, again, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for allowing me to, to comment on that. And I'll turn it over to, to you and the board for discussion. 
Thank you, Roberto. And and for my personal opinion, that's something I was going to mention too. I mean, my biggest question mark, you know, is around the city's revenue and the city budget. Um, you know, how has COVID impacted the budget and the city revenue? Um, I know the budget office has put out projections on what the revenue will look like. Um, now that we're you know, three, four months into it, you know, how accurate have those been projections? Are they, you know, in, in line? Have they been worse than expected or better than expected? Um, you know, the next month or two, we're going to start kicking off the conversations around the actuarial stuff, discount rate. Um, and I think this, the budget discussion and um, the ability for the city to pay, uh, I think would play a role into um, our actuarial discussions. Um, so those are my two, th those are my thoughts. Um, Howard Lee, do you have any comments uh, or things that you'd like to discuss at the meeting? No, I, I think, I think what you said covers it. I, I really am interested on in the, uh, the, uh, the city retirement costs and the, the budget projections as it relates to the impact of COVID-19. All right. Thank you, Howard. Uh, Eswar? Uh, nothing to add, Andrew. Right. Nick? No, sir. Uh, Santos? Well, maybe the council and the, the uh, city attorney may want to comment on what um, Harvey Lederman said in their in their interpretation of what took place might be helpful to all the retirees. All right, got that noted. Thank you, Santos. Um, Sunita. Nothing to add. Thank you. All right, Vince. I had two items for consideration. One, an educational piece, and I think it's very timely given what Prabhu shared with us about the plan's fiscal returns, would be to talk about the S&P 500 and do a little educational section around that. Um, why that particular topic would be so important is that we have heard it consistently time after time at these joint meetings, council members um, asking why we're not invested in the S&P 500 and as Steve McCourt pointed out earlier, the concentration risk that's happening there. I think it's very important that we uh, try and demonstrate, given what we've just been through in the last two quarters, one, the volatility of the S&P 500 and compare that to our plan. Mm -hmm. Two, the concentration of those top five names in the S&P and then three, explain the difference of the cap weighted versus equal weighted of the S&P 500. And maybe we can start to put that issue to bed if we use it as a, a way of educating um, council members and the public at large. Uh, obviously with the firm that I work for, I have a lot of material that I can work with Prabhu in helping prepare information on this. The second thing is um, what was being talked about on the discount rate side. We have previously talked about um, if we got into a deep recession or city finances became difficult, how we might tackle the amortization schedule, which we've been very aggressive on in, in potentially adjusting the amortization schedule at a time like this. And it, uh, possibly we want to engage Chiron and, and looking at scenarios. I would I would definitely look for council's input on this if this is an appropriate place for us to um, at least share some thoughts around this. He may think it should be discussed at the board meeting only, but I can envision coming up here in the next few months the discussion around potentially lowering our discount rate and the financial impact to the city and the offset might be adjusting our amortization schedule. So sorry to be long-winded, but I think those are two very important topics to consider. Thank you, Vince. Franco. Nothing to add. All right, uh, I don't believe I skipped any trustees. I heard Roberto Harvey, uh, do you have any thoughts, comments that would be a good discussion items? Uh, I think the ones that have been mentioned are probably the most prominent and are the best ones to go forward with. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Prabhu. I, I second Vince's comments and uh, happy to work with him. 
last year, uh, Vince, myself, and Trustee Chandra made the presentation. And if Vince is uh, willing to volunteer his time again, we'll be happy to work with him. Uh, and there can never be enough education on these. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Council Member Foley. I, I think the list of topics you have is great. Uh, when you get to the education piece though, it should be very plain language so that we all understand what you're talking about. None of us are professionals in this business. No so just keep it simple, Vince. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take these and um, share it with uh, um, Federated and also the city. Um, I know Cheryl's on the line, so she's taking notes also on this. Um, if there's between now and then, if there's other topics that come up in the next month or so, um, uh, please share them with Roberto. If there is no other comments on this one, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, number uh, letter D, discussion action on committee assignments. Can I add something in about that joint meeting? Sure. Um, uh, just if I could, uh, just a heads up, as all, since all of our meetings are public, there may be people there who are uh, members of the public who may want to comment and that'll be up to the mayor and, and how they're gonna handle any comments. But just be concerned or aware that questions will come up around equity and how uh, our assets are being allocated in uh, not an equitable fashion, but how they may be affecting uh, people of color. Just I'm just putting that out there as something that is top of mind of us at city council and you might just, just to be aware of it. Thank you, council member uh, Foley. We'll definitely note that and take that in consideration and prepare for something like that. And then we'll coordinate with city council and, um, on how do we facilitate questions. Thank you. All right, discussion and action on committee assignments. Um, the, the reason this came forward, uh, as you all know, we welcomed a, the newest trustee um, to, to the board. Um, I've always have, was a firm believer of, you know, try not to assign the new people, you know, uh, assignments right away and let them get their feet wet. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to do that for Howard Lee since we had so many holes that we had to plug. Um, but I still want to try and uh, extend that olive branch to um, Sunita. Um, with that said, I mean, I'm open for suggestions, but my recommendation was pretty much to keep everything um, the same except for one small adjustment, um, which would be under the government committee. Um, I did a little tally to see, you know, who, how many people are sitting on each committee. And for the most part, everybody has uh, two committees. Um, there was a few people that might have three, but they were alternates on them. Um, and so the one adjustment I was, I was thinking of, of making and seeing guys get feedback on was the governance committee. Um, it, it, haven't spoken to Franco, but thought, you know, if Franco is willing to drop off that as an alternate, we could put Sunita in there as an alternate. This gives her the flexibility to get her feet wet and get um, acclimated to everything. Um, and she would only be participating in the government's committee if there's a someone that's unable to attend. Um, otherwise, just thinking about just keeping everything as is until we typically do our big shuffle um, in December or uh, January timeframe. Um, so, because from my understanding right now, Nick is not going to, Nick's gonna stay on for another four years and Vince is gonna stay on another four years and, Frank, and Franco's not retiring. Yeah, pretty much sums it up. Yeah, so um, so is there any thoughts about uh, those, uh, on the small change? Franco, do you have any comments? Yeah, I'm fine with it. You fine with it? Sunita, how do you feel about that? Makes sense. Okay. And so just to let you know that those meetings happen quarterly. Um, it's typically when uh, uh, alternates come are, are used as if someone is unable to make that meeting. Uh, so it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, if there's, is there any other comments or suggestions from any other trustees? All right, if not, uh, Harvey, do we need approval for this, a, a motion or we good as is? As I recall, the, the appointments are made uh, by the chair. Okay. okay. So then uh, no, I guess, further action would be needed or no uh, uh, motion, I guess. So with that, yes. with that said, we'll go ahead and move on to, um, we'll conclude that and we'll go to retirement. Um, retirement services, uh, these are the people that are retiring. Uh, we got Karen K. Atten, police sergeant, police department, effective August 8th, 2020, uh, with 27.03 years of service. Robert W. Brown, Battalion Chief, Fire Department, effective August 8th, 2020, with 26.18 years of service. Christopher J.G. Crowley, Fire Captain, Fire Department, effective July 11th, 2020, with 31.26 years of service with reciprocity. William Foster, Police Officer, Police Department, effective August 20, the 22nd, 2020, with 27.13 years of service, with reciprocity. Uh, Enrique Garcia, Jr., Police Sergeant, uh, Police Department, effective August 8th, 2020, with 28.11 years of service. Keith A. Kermsey, Fire Engineer, Fire Department, effective August 22nd, 2020, with 30.52 years of service. Tim H. Pedamonte, Fire Captain, Fire Department, effective August 22nd, 2020 with 25.71 years of service with reciprocity. Jeffrey B. Uh, uh, Profio, uh, Police Lieutenant, Police Department, effective August 22nd, 2020 with 23.15 years of service. Michael Van Elgort, Deputy Fire Chief, Fire Department, effective August 8th, 2020 with 25.3 years of service. John A. Ward, Police, uh, police Officer, uh, Police Department, effective August 8th, 2020, with 26.3 years of service with reciprocity. And then, and then we'll get the two defer, uh, deferred vestiges real quick. Um, Paul F. Uh, Far Farina, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Police Officer, Police Department, effective August 1st, 2020, with 10.61 years of service with reciprocity. And then Diane C. Wynn, Police Officer, Police Department, affected June 9th, 2020, with 20.26 years of service. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve from Vince. Second, Santos. Motion uh, by Vince, uh, second by Santos. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Drew Lanza is absent. Uh, Howard Lee. Yes. Uh, Eswar? Aye. Nick? Yes. Rick, uh, Santos? Yes. Vince? Yes. Franco? Aye. And myself? Aye. Congratulations to all those people that are retiring. Uh, definitely a lot of people. We even have a few, few people in here with over 30 years retiring. Um, thank you for your service and time uh, to the city. Um, First, on a personal note, uh, Fire Captain Christopher Crowley, he's been my captain for the last, I think, seven, eight years now. Um, he ended up putting total service around 33 years between two departments, but 31 with us. He is a class act gentleman, um, going to miss him greatly, uh, but I enjoy his retirement. Um, a few other uh, people from the fire department side, Tim Pedabonte and Chief Van Elgort. Uh, they and um, they have been wonderful people to work with. They've been provided great leadership, um, and so enjoy your retirement. And there's one person that I definitely want to point out: uh, uh, Keith Kermsey. Um, he is a uh, he's a gentleman, person that everybody looked up to. He's a role model in our department, um, and also that you know his uh, wife worked. She just recently retired, but she was part of retirement services. Um, so congratulations on your retirement and um, we uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy the time off.
Anybody else? Um, Franco, do you have any comment or Nick? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I can uh, indulge you for a couple of minutes, if I may. Okay. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of good friends on this list, and so uh, much respect uh, for everybody doing this job for as long as they did. We're going to miss everybody. Uh, but uh, 15 years ago, as a uh, as a sergeant, I was uh, tasked to uh, go into the uh, press information office and take over as the PIO sergeant. When I went in there, I had two young officers working with me. Uh, one was Gina T. Porton, and the other one was Officer Enrique Garcia. So fast forward 15 years, I've since retired. Enrique has since been promoted to sergeant, and now he is in the uh, press information officer as the uh, sergeant there. And his officer is uh, once again, Gina T. Porton. So if you've been following the news lately, you know uh, how difficult it can be, uh, can be working with members of the media. Uh, Enrique has conducted himself with uh, integrity and dignity. He's represented himself, this department and this city uh, to, the, uh, to the highest standards. And uh, we were lucky to have him. And so to my friend, I just wanna wish him all the best in retirement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Nick. All right, um, I, I apologize to uh, Sunita uh, when I did the roll call vote, skipped over your name. Um, Sunita, how do you vote? Hi, not offended, no worries, hi. <laughs> All right, appreciate it, thank you very much. All right. So we're going to go into uh, seven deaths and um, survivorship notifications. Notification of the death of uh, Philip Croyle, Battalion Chief, retired January 24th, uh, 2009, died May 30th, 2020. Survivorship benefits to Cheryl Croyle, spouse. Notification of the death of Ronald T. Daly, police officer, retired December 26, 2009, died July 15th, 2020. Survivorship benefits to um, Diane Daly, spouse. Notification of the death of Thomas K. Uh, Shigamasa, Assistant Chief of Police, retired January 15, 1998, died June 18, 2020. Survivorship benefits to Sue E. Shigamasa, spouse. Notification of the death of Phyllis Trussler, police officer, retired October 1, 1992, died May 1, 2020, no survivorship benefits. At this moment, let's take a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Um, does any of the retirees have any comments um, that they want to share? Yes, Mr. Chair, I worked with Phil and I knew Assistant Chief of the Police Department and uh, it, it's sad and especially Phil Coyle because he was a young battalion chief and didn't get a chance to live long enough. Hell of a football player, hell of a firefighter, and very good battalion chief, the best of his family. Thank you, Dick. All right, if there's no other comments, um, we actually do have to take a break in one minute, um, but from looking at the rest of the agenda, um, there is no oral updates um, needed provided on any of the items due to no meetings happening. Um, so uh, with that said, if there's no other comments, we could probably adjourn this meeting. That's a good second for me. All right. Well, thank you everybody for this meeting and we will uh, talk next month. Good Peace job. Everybody. Thanks. Good job, thank you.